Jason. Thank you very much to, for talking to Bloomberg with us uh, today about the Olympics. Less than 50 days to go, seven weeks, I think you were saying exactly, to go until it all starts. Obviously, you won the Games in a, in a very different time, um, pre the, the terrorist attacks in London, pre the recession, pre the, the Eurozone crisis. Can we really afford it? Yeah, I mean, look, you expect with a seven-year period, which is what you get, to, uh, to put in place your preparations for staging your games, that you're going to go through a number of cycles. So we expected some good times, some tougher times. I mean, you're right, on balance, um, you know, we didn't expect ourselves really from 2008 uh, onwards to be sinking into a credit crunch from which it's been tough to emerge. But, you know, we've made it work. You have made it work. The government has obviously produced £9 billion. Um, LOCOG itself have raised over £2 billion, and you've been largely responsible for that. How did you do it, and how have you managed to do it, given these economic times that we're talking about? Yeah, I mean, from a budget point of view, you're right. There are two budgets for the Games. The, the government budget, which we put in place very early, £9 billion. Pounds, and I mean, the government deserves credit for putting that in place very early on, for having it scoped properly, and for including within it a contingency 2.7 billion pounds, which allowed us to meet any you know unforeseen certain uh, unforeseen events. For example, you know not being able to finance the Olympic Village and the Broadcast and Press Centre in the private capital markets, which is what we'd originally expected. So they were able to warehouse it within the you know within the government uh, funding contingency, which helped us get it done. On the private side, you know we uh, we moved very quickly to put uh, our sponsorship in place. That was very successful. We've got a great team here working on that, and you know. Big British companies responded in a big way. They wanted to be part of the biggest thing happening, you know, in our city, in our country, in our lifetimes, and uh, and get signed up. And that's been terrific. Their response. Given your experience in the financial sector, when you took over the job, did you did you foresee what might happen, or not not in exact terms? But did you think I've got to move quickly because times can change? I say, if I'd have been able to foresee it, I'd have stayed in my own job. Uh, in my old job, rather, because it would have been very handy. But no, it's really, um, uh, you know, just a matter of getting deals done when you can. I think that's what um, working in the financial sector had taught me. You know, when things are fine, that's when you move. That's when you you close deals. So it wasn't by mistake that our first deal on the sponsorship side was in the financial sector. It was with um, Lloyd's TSB, a terrific partner. Um, we got that done early, the banking sector was in great shape and it set a benchmark both in value terms and in prestige terms for the kinds of companies that follow along afterwards and we got a few done early on, that got the program up and running and then we, you know, we had to, this wasn't easy, you know, it was hand-to-hand uh, -hand -hand combat getting one done at a time. Uh, selling them on the benefits of being associated with the games, what it can do for your brand, what it can do for your own people, and how you can use it as a platform really for prosecuting your own um, corporate uh, social agendas. Uh, and all that came together. You're on budget, you're on time. There's a lot of talk about that, but obviously security is still an issue. The budget for that has had to be doubled, and that's probably not something that you can completely quantify because we don't know what's going to happen and hopefully nothing awful is going to happen but is that a concern to you that that cost could continue to spiral? Well at this point of course there's only so much money you can spend by the time you're uh, seven weeks out uh, most of the uh, most of the money is effectively spent or committed so at this point the budget's uh, really well under control. I mean with respect to security of course you, it's not an area where uh, anybody would want us uh, to take any chances uh, you talk about the budget going up. I mean, effectively, a lot of the planning for security in detail can only get done when you finish the planning for the rest of the event because you've got to know what it is you're protecting. So when I talked a little bit uh, earlier about having a contingency, I mean, it's for that kind of thing that the money was set aside. So spending it in, uh, in the area of security wasn't really a surprise to any of us. We just needed the plans to be firmed up, knowing what we wanted to protect and how we were going to do it. And, and that's all in place now. Um, you talked a little bit about partners and, and sponsorship. Um, this is also the first year where corporate hospitality has been actually on site. How have sponsorship, corporate hospitality, how important is that to be able to produce a successful Games? 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a part of it. I mean, w when you look at um, selling tickets, for example, it's been very important for us to get as many out into the hands of the UK public as possible. It's been important to have a, a slug that you can sell to the international public because it's a big international event. Just as Brits want to be able to go to events overseas, people from overseas are really looking forward to the opportunity of coming to London, a city they love. And, and hospitality fits into the, you know, into the corporate um, segment of that both with our sponsors, you know, for them, one of the attractions of being a partner is that you do get access to some good tickets and you can use those tickets to entertain, um, obviously, your clients, but also, um, you know, use them to motivate uh, your own uh, employees. And a lot of, you know, some of the sponsors have used them only uh, for their own people because, uh, you know, they wanted to sort of invest uh, in their own staff. And that's been a very powerful motivation. There has been some controversy about some of the sponsors, Dow Chemicals, um, but I know that you know you've said that they're still going to sponsor the games. It does it, money transcend everything? Is that what's important, or have you thought about the companies that have signed up? Yeah, I mean we've thought very carefully about the companies that have signed up, and in in each of the uh, arrangements we've put in place, we've worked very hard with them to make sure they understand you know what we're trying uh, to accomplish with the games. For example, I mean you know specifically I you know take the torch relay, where we've worked with companies on their own torch bearers and try to make absolutely sure that the people they nominate have the same kind of personal best contribution to the community as the more general torch bearers we've got. So, you know, the, the reason the sponsors are prepared to buy in at, uh, you know, in some cases quite high values to the games is because they buy into what we're trying to do and it supports their own uh, corporate and social goals. Tickets, do you think it's been the fairest system. There are people who are sort of still complaining that they haven't got tickets, people who live in London who feel like they've paid a lot for the games being here but still can't get a ticket. In hindsight, would you do anything differently? Do you think the criticism is unfair? Well, the, the principal issue around tickets is the extraordinarily high levels of demand around a finite supply. You know, in the first round of ticketing, we saw demand for about 23 million uh, tickets and we only had at that point about six million to sell and if you actually looked at the ratios with respect to the highest demand events like the athletics, swimming, gymnastics and the ceremonies and the cheapest tickets in those events I mean the ratios were you know, you know thousands to one to get a ticket because everybody wanted what they perceived to be the best and the cheapest tickets so in those cases you know people were it was it was like entering a, it was literally a lottery you, you, you there were very long odds of being successful i think since then we've tried to prioritize people who applied and who were unsuccessful they've had a chance to have a go at the slightly less popular tickets and we still have tickets available now you know we've got uh, about a million tickets for the Olympic football which has lots of games men's and women's tournaments and big big venues we've got about a million tickets left for the Paralympics even though by historical standards already selling a million is an extraordinary record and we're confident those will go up to the uh, Paris we've got something like 500,000 tickets left for the uh, the other Olympic events half of which are already on the market the other half of which will come on in the next few weeks as we finalize the details of the seating in the venue. So, so there are still tickets available. You should you know, go on our website and buy some. And you, if you've already got some, you can fill out your day or week at the games. Or if you haven't been lucky, there's still some good stuff uh, available. What about getting to the games? Transport's always an issue in London. We've just seen the Jubilee, uh, you know, huge crowds coming to, to London. There have been problems on the Tube. Are you, are you worried about that? I mean. It's so important that we get this right. It's an international stage business, you know, for all the reputation for London. Are you worried about transport? Yeah, I mean, it's really important that London is seen to be able to make this work. Uh, I mean, there will be queues going to any big event, certainly a sporting event. You expect to queue up to get in and to come out. And the transport is always the pinch point And the games won't be any different in that respect. I mean, we spent a lot of money on the transport infrastructure, in particular the lines that get you into East London, you know, the frequency on the Jubilee line, uh, the DLR's been expanded, the East London line, the North London line have been expanded, big new stations at Stratford and at King's Cross. So six and a half billion pounds worth of infrastructure to increase the capacity there. Um, and we're now embarked on a very significant communication campaign. So people with tickets, know how long they should give themselves, the, the best ways to get to their venues. 
and people who are trying to get around London to do their normal business and, how, and businesses and how they can get their freight delivered, you know, just explaining to them which stations are going to be busy when so they can manage their own travel to avoid the busiest times. That should help just to suppress demand at times when it could be really busy. Businesses, you mentioned there, are the games good for businesses in London and the UK? Have we seen a boost and will we see one with the legacy afterwards? Yeah, I mean, we've seen so many examples of it. I mean, if you think in terms of the sheer, if you like, um, you know, economic injection from the games, uh, both in the construction and now providing the goods and services, we've seen something like seven and a half billion pounds spent in the UK economy, virtually all of it, ni you know, 95, 96% of it with UK companies, half of them SMEs, and uh, it's about 2,000 companies have won those contracts. And it's not just been, you know, those jobs, those contracts, and, and the specificity of that. It's, you know, the track record of being able to say, I was part of doing, the, you know, the biggest, most important, most complicated event the world ever sees in my own country, and developing the expertise that came with that, and the track record, which is you know, terrific when you use it as part of your pitch materials for the next big contract. So that's a very powerful big business legacy. And, and we'll do a great job. You know, companies that worked with us on winning the bid are now signed up to help all sorts of other cities um, you know, the pitch for uh, events around the world. You know, at the companies here which built the Olympic Park, a great example of British construction you know, on time, on budget, cutting edge techniques in areas like sustainability. They're winning contracts around the world. And now when we host the games, you know, all the uh, industries that go into that will do brilliantly. I mean, look at our Olympic torch, designed in uh, Hackney, um, engineered in Basildon, manufactured in Coventry. I mean, getting extraordinary um, coverage really right around the world as people cover the torch relay. Legacy, though, um, is an issue. I mean, obviously, we, we won the bid on the fact that we said that we regenerate the east of London. There are probably still some businesses complaining about the fact that well, I've met a few who say that not enough has been done. Obviously, we don't know what's going to happen to the stadium yet when it's over. Are you concerned about the question of legacy? Do you think the sort of shine's coming off slightly, or is that unfair? Well, I think that legacy was an absolutely crucial pillar of the bid. We've thought of it every stage of the way as we've delivered the games. And here we are talking about legacy. We still haven't had the games yet. Legacy is supposed to be something that's inspired by and comes after the games. Just think of the amount of time and effort that's gone into it already. You know, we set up an Olympic Park legacy company two years ago to figure out the ultimate use of the venues and the park. And we've got six out of the eight venues that are permanent already have those uses established. The seventh, the broadcast center, should get worked out in the summer. The stadium should follow after that. Um, and, you know, if you just take yourself back five years and look at that Olympic Park around Stratford as it was then, you know, we took down, what was it, 52 electricity pylons. It's completely transformed. You know, it stimulated the building of, um, you know, Europe's biggest urban shopping centre, Stratford City. Uh, we've got the Athletes Village going up. You know, we'll have, you know, 17,000 people there staying at the Games, but that's the beginning of a huge residential development in that part of London, which we need to expand London's living space. So I think by any measure, you know, the focus that we've given regeneration with our immovable seven-year deadline has really concentrated into a very short period of time, um, a redevelopment that would otherwise have taken decades and decades. Um, I want to ask a little bit about you. You worked at Goldman Sachs for 22 years, is that right? What what caused the change of heart? Was this your dream job, or I gather you saw an advert for it in The Economist and then applied, but what made you decide to leave Goldman Sachs and, and come and do this? Well, 22 years is a long time to you know, work anywhere. It's probably the, it, was the, it was the longest relationship I'd had with anybody except my, my mother and father at that point. So it didn't seem to me that actually being open to change was, was too reckless a thing to do. And look, here it was in my city, uh, in my lifetime, the most exciting uh, sporting event coming to town. I'd you know, always been uh, you know, a big sports fan, a big sport participant, so it was something I was fascinated by. And I just happened to be at the stage in my life where I had a sort of set of skills that uh, thankfully they found vaguely useful. So it all came together and you know, life's not a dress rehearsal. Uh, and I went for it and uh, they gave me the job. Have you found that your previous career has helped you? I mean, as you said, that they saw the skills in you, but have you found it helpful? Has it sort of, I don't know, 
allowed you to do your job with more ease because you've had a sort of outside perspective, I suppose? Well, I'm not sure. I've, I, doing the job with ease is quite how I describe the experience of the last seven years. I mean, it, it, this isn't a job for which you can really be prepared or have the right experience. You have bits of experience. It's really a leadership job. Um, you know, because what, what I had to do was to build the organization and the relationships that could then deliver, you know, the world's biggest event. So, it, it, and, you know, there are bits of it I understood and knew better. For example, how to raise the money comes pretty naturally if you've had a career in investment banking, you know, understanding the budget, um, you know, understanding how to run a project in a tight way building relationships with all the different parties you need to get on board and gather them around a clear set of objectives and goals and timetables. So th those things are sort of generic leadership skills and those are the ones that I probably had to call on most. I mean, you know, what I learned at Goldman was you, you need really, really good people and you need for them to work together in a team. And that's the kind of culture that we've tried to build here and I think quite successfully. And when you've got a a project like this, you know, the greatest thing happening in your city in your lifetime, you can get a lot of people to come around you and say, yep, I want to be part of that. So, you know, they come really equipped with very high motivation, which helps with that. Are you getting any sleep? Are you, are you looking forward to it or is it just nail biting stuff? It's, I mean, look, it's very exciting at the moment and the, and the time just flies away. The closer you get to the deadline, the, uh, the sort of the more exponential the passage of time. So it's rushing towards us at the moment. You know, two or three years ago, we thought we had a lot of time, you know, seven weeks to go. Uh, we really are down into the final, uh, into the final stages. I mean, it's, it's great to be part of it. You know, you're sharing it with an immense team of people from many, many organizations who've contributed. I think when the athletes start arriving and when we start to dress the city, which you'll see shortly uh, now that the Jubilee is over and we can sort of move into Olympic time, you know, you'll, again, that'll build, uh, you'll see the excitement building, the stories around the athletes as they're getting ready and their hopes and dreams and, uh, you know, prospects of medals. That'll really start to, to raise things up. So, yeah, I mean, for me, in many ways, the toughest times were back in earlier days when you were really trying to do the hard work of saying, well, who's got to do what work and what is it? How much is that really going to cost? Who has the money for that? What are the interface points and are they together? And that, that required some really tough work in the earlier days. Now that's done, everybody understands what they've got to do. They've got the resources to do it. We're all pointed in the same direction. There's a great team across the project. You know, a a actually now I'm as, I'm as much a cheerleader to keep my guys going, uh, which, is, which is fun in fact, because you're seeing people doing the best work of their lives at the moment. And just finally, when it's all over, have you got any plans other than taking a holiday? Are you going to go back to banking? Are you going to retire? Are you going to, what, what's the plan? A long holiday, and then we'll, uh, we'll think about what, uh, you know, what, what might be possible. But uh, you know, for once in my life, I don't want to be spending my time really trying to figure out, okay, what's tomorrow? What's on my to-do list? So um, I think a period of relaxation and reflection before I dive into something else. And back into the financial world, or would it be something completely different? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, it, it's, I, I've enjoyed so much the opportunity to do something different because change is, is so stimulating. You know, I've learned such a lot, right? I never spent so much time working in different parts of the public sector, you know, central government, city government, local government, dealing so much with the media. You don't get that in, uh, in the investment banking field. So I've been exposed to a lot, which has you know, taught me a lot. And I'm sure that anything I do in the future will sort of build on some of the things I've been, uh, I've been lucky enough to learn. All right, Paul Dyson, thank you very much and good luck. Thank you.